Welcome back to Advent of Code 2025. For today's problem, we're given a list of boxes with 3D coordinates, and we need to connect them together such that electricity is able to reach all of the jun junction boxes. And they're in a 3D space, and the distance is measured using straight line distance, so Euclidean distance, um, basically meaning we're using the actual direct distance as you would imagine in real life. Um, so we'll be using math.hypotenuse um, to do this, but the formula that you would do this with is basically to just take the difference in each uh, coordinate direction and then take the square of each of those, sum them together, and then take the square root. It's basically the same thing as with the Pythagorean theorem, but with three values instead of two. Um, when we connect two junction boxes together, electricity can flow between them, so they become part of the same circuit. And in order to save on string lights, we're going to focus on connecting pairs that are as close together as possible. So basically, we will repeatedly connect the closest two junction boxes. Now, sometimes we'll connect two junction boxes that are already part of the same circuit. So if we connect those together, then nothing will actually change as far as the sizes of each circuit. And this process continues for a while, and the elves are concerned that they don't have enough extension cables, so they want to know how big the circuits that result will be. So essentially, we basically just take a look at every possible pair of junction boxes, order the possible edges by length, and then just iterate through them in order. Um, and then after making the 10 shortest connections, in, this ex in the example input, we'll end up with 11 circuits containing 5, 4, 2, 2, and all of the remainder are just a single junction box. And the answer we want to produce is the product of the sizes of the three largest circuits. And so our list contains a thousand junction, uh, sorry, our list contains a bunch of junction boxes, and we want to connect the 1,000 pairs that are closest together and determine what the uh, sizes of the three largest circuits are multiplied together. Important thing to note is that for some reason we are still connecting junction boxes even if they're already in the same circuit. Uh, despite being concerned about having enough extension cables, we are still wasting them on closing loops within circuits. Um, so input format today is fortunately pretty straightforward. We just take each line, split it on commas, and then parse each component to an integer. Okay. And since we are just greedily going through all of the edges in order, we want to represent the edges. Um, and the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to store the edges as pairs of Court, uh, of indexes. So an edge between this valley and this valley would be stored as the pair 0, 1. And so edges is going to basically be a list of i, j for i in range up to the number of boxes for j in range starting from the index after i up to the number of boxes. So this is just going to be every pair with the first number smaller than the second number that's arbitrary just to avoid duplicates. And then we want to sort the edges. So we'll do edges.sort, and the key is going to be a function that takes in a pair. And the key function essentially allows us to sort the edges by a given function. So rather than sorting edges by the value of edges themselves, we sort them by the values passed through this function. So for example, if we took a list and sorted it according to negative x, then we would get them in reverse order because we're now sorting an increasing order of what happens when we pass the values into this function. So 3 gets mapped to negative 3, 2 gets mapped to negative 2, and 1 gets mapped to negative 1 for sorting. So equivalently here, we want our key to map each edge to its length such that we're sorting the edges by length. And the length is just going to be math.hypot between the coordinates. And math.hypot takes in um, a, any number of arguments that are numbers representing the distance in each direction. 
And so we'll use the splat operator on a list to distribute those arguments, distribute a list across all of the arguments. And the differences will be x minus y for x, y in the zip boxes x zero and boxes x one. So this might be a bit messy, so let's go through this part by part. Uh, x is a pair representing the first and last index of the edge. So boxes at x0 is going to be the first box that the edge connects to, and boxes at x1 is the second box the edge connects to. That's going to give us two lists of x, y, z. We use the zip function to go through them column by column, so that will give us three pairs with the x differences, the y differences, and the z differences. And then, let's do this to avoid confusion. For each of those pairs, we take one value and subtract from the other, and so this will give us a list consisting of the x, the y, and the z coordinate differences. We use the splat operator such that um, the list of three values ends up as three arguments to map.hypot, and that gives us the hypotenuse, which gives us the length of the edge. So now we're sorting the edges in increasing order by their length. So for example, if we output this now, we'll see that the first edge in this list is 0, 19, which is the edge between the first and the last box, which is what we are informed is the closest together. Okay. So now we want to connect the edges together and we want to be able to identify the circuits. And so we need some way to join two circuits together when the edges are connected, but also to identify when a circuit is already joined. And for this, we're going to use disjoint sets. Disjoint sets are a data structure wherein we have a bunch of objects that are contained within sets and all of the sets are disjoint, meaning they have no overlap. So for example, if we're given, let's say six objects, a valid disjoint set would, to, would be to have, let's say one, two, four in a set, five, six in a set, and three in its own set. We could also have all of them in their own sets. We could also have all of them in one set. What we couldn't have is a number contained within multiple sets or a number not contained in any sets. Now, the typical implementation for this is to represent this as a graph, um, or rather as a bunch, a list of trees. So for example, if we wanted to represent this set configuration, we, we could, for example, represent that like so. And so this is a bunch of trees. And each time we want to merge two sets together, we can move one of the trees into the other tree. So let's briefly go over how this would be implemented. In order to identify the trees, we're going to store the parent of each node, which is initially going to be just the node itself. So that'll be um, a map from each node index to itself, which basically is the initial state of each item existing in its own set. So this is what our beginning state looks like where all of the circuit boxes are disconnected. And so we'll represent as such that parent i is equal to the parent node of the node with index i. And so if each node is initially its own index, then it'll just be i for i in, or it'll rather just be list range len boxes. So initially parent zero is zero, parent six is six, so on and so forth. Next, we'll define a function that'll get the root of the tree a node is in. So for example, if we are at four, we'd want to go to one. If we put a seven down here, then from seven, we'd want to go to one. Basically, the root function will tell us which what the root of the tree that our current node is in, and that's how we're going to identify which set the node is in. So this basically says seven is in the set that contains one, and because each tree can only have one root, that means that the set containing four is also the set one, and so we can uniquely identify the sets. So we'll just do that recursively. If parent x equals x, then we'll just return x itself. And otherwise, we will return 
root of parent x. And so we'll recursively find the root of the tree. And then we'll define a function to merge two values, to, two sets together. So merge is basically if the connect um, method here. So when we connect two junction boxes together, we're going to call the merge function on their indexes. And so like I said, when we do a merge, we want to move one tree within the other. So we're going to find the root of the first tree and make it a child of the second tree. So we'll do parent of root a equals b. And so this says, given the root of a, which is the node that is at the top of its tree, we will put it as a child of b, which means that b is now the root of a, and also the root of everything else that was previously within the same set. Now, before we continue to the implementation tying this all together, let's go over um, two quick optimizations. So first of all, note that the root function recursively goes up one layer each time, which means that it does take time proportional to the depth of a tree. Given extremely hostile input, we could end up with a case where all of the nodes end up in one tr really, really tall tree. Now, this is realistically not going to happen in a sufficiently random input, but what we can do is something called path compression. What we notice is that we don't actually care about the structure of the tree. We just want to be able to go from each item to its root. So if we know that the root of seven is one, then rather than going through the four each time, we can just make seven a child of one. And as a matter of fact, if we have a bunch of nodes in a chain, then each time we go through any of them, we can just move it to become a child of one. So this is called path compression because we're compressing the entire path to become flat, which means that the next time we want to know what the root of five is, we no longer need to trace through all of these points. We just go directly up to one. So to do that, we observe that if the root of x is the root of parent of x, then we can just set parent of x equal to that same root like so. And then we can just return that value. Um, I don't know how to use the walrus operator, to be honest. Um, well, let's just do this, I guess. So what this is, uh, I guess, yeah, we can do this. So this function now says if x is its own parent, we know that that's how we're defining the roots. So it means that it's already the root, so we return it itself. Otherwise, we recursively find the root of its parent and then set the parent of x to that root directly to path compress and then return that value. And secondly, in the spirit of keeping our uh, trees short, we also don't want to make a tree, like let's say we're moving the set rooted at one underneath a different tree. Um, we don't want to move one to the child of a descendant of five. Rather, we'll use the root function to find the root of that node and then move this underneath the five directly. So rather than making the parent of root a equal to b, we'll make it equal to the root of b. This step is not really as necessary because path compression will already resolve this issue, more or less, um, but it was six characters, so it's worth adding as an optimization. The final optimization that can theoretically be done is to figure out which one of these two trees is deeper and put the shallower tree as a child of the deeper tree to avoid increasing the depth further. But that is wholly unnecessary because path compression already solves that issue just fine. And that's a lot of extra work for not really any noticeable gain. OK, let's move on to tying this all together. So we're going to look at the first n edges by length. So in the initial example, we're just making the 10 shortest connections. So let's say for a, b in edges up to the 10th. So for each of the first 10 edges, we will merge a and b. And that's pretty much that. And so this graph now tells us what all the circuits are. So this isn't very easy to read, but basically, 
we can see that what this is saying is that the circle box at index zero is in the tree of 19, which is in the tree of seven, which is in the tree of seven itself. So that's one circuit. And then we have these three nodes that are all in the tree of 18, which is this one. So that's a circuit of size something. I, uh, yeah, this one is, this one has a parent of eight, which is here. So that means that this is also in the same set as these three values. And it's also in the same set as this value. So that's the circuit of size five that we have. So now we just need to determine what the size of each circuit is. So we can represent this as a list of sizes like so. And then each time we will just look at a junction box, identify which set it's in, and increase the size of that set. So that'll look like this, for box in boxes, sizes of root box plus equals one. And so for each junction box, we'll find the root, which is a unique identifier for its set. It's arbitrary which junction box has been considered the root of its set, but it does not matter because we only care about the size of each circuit. So now that'll give us the size. Mm. Yeah. That. Uh, so now this is the size of each box. You'll notice there are a lot of zero values. That just means that the box is within a set but not considered the root, which means that it doesn't have any thing under it, basically. So we'll see that we have a circuit of size five, a circuit of size four, two circuits of size two, a couple of circuits of size one, and the zeros are effectively not counted. And so we can just sort this in reverse, get the and then multiply the first three by each other. And to solve the actual input, we just need to modify the 10 to 1000 here, and that'll give us our answer for part one. Moving on to part two, we are going to keep connecting the junction boxes together until they're all in one large circuit, and we need to figure out what the last connection we make is. So as soon as we make a connection that causes all of them to form a single circuit, we'll stop, multiply the x coordinates of the junction boxes that we connected together, and output that as our answer. So this part two is actually rather trivial with the way that we've gone about implementing it. Um, rather than looping through the first n edges, we'll just loop through all of the edges. To identify when we're done, we'll keep a track of the we'll keep track of the number of circuits that exist, which is initially equal to the number of boxes because each one is its own circuit. And then each time we'll check if the root of a is equal to the root of b. That means that they're already in the same circuit, so we can skip the connection. And if they're not, then we merge them together and decrease the number of circuits by one because each time we connect two circuits together, we have made two circuits into one circuit, which is a difference of one. And so once the number of circuits is equal to one, then since we just made a connection between A and B, we can simply print the X coordinate of box A and the X coordinate of box B, and then break out of the loop. Um, And yes, yes. Um, and that gives us, sorry, I was looking at my actual puzzle input. Okay, and yeah, that'll get us our answer for part two. So thank you very much for watching and I'll see you tomorrow for day nine.